in the UK, in British English, we say router for this thing that forwards data that finds a route. And we say router for the woodworking tool that you make a groove with. Uh, in America, they use the word router for both. It's the same pronunciation for both. Gotcha. And uh, I believe routing is something completely different in Australia, but we don't have to go there. Oh, we won't go there. What happens if there's a serious problem with routers? Ultimately, it will mean that you can't get your data through. So either you can't get your requests through or you can't get the responses back. So it will stop you interacting with the services you normally interact with. So you might notice that because you're web browsing and suddenly you can't get somewhere. You might notice that, so you can't get to Facebook, for example. You might notice that because you um, start receiving very poor performance. So you can still get through, but everything slows down a lot. So what's going on inside the router now? I suppose that's the... So I guess the way to think of it is you've got a router, and so there's going to be some data arriving, some stream of packets that are arriving into one of these interfaces, and the router has to decide which of those packets are going to go out here, which of those packets maybe are going to go out here, what to do. And maybe some of those packets are just going to get dropped. Um, the router's not going to know what to do with them. This is the in interface, these are the out interfaces. So these would be mirrored. Yeah, so you've got, you know, this is interface one, two, three. This would be one, two, three as well. So data's going in both directions on each interface. The router has to make this decision about what should occur, what should happen. Should it drop it? Should it forward it? And if it's going to forward it, which interface should it forward it out of? Um, and that's the process of forwarding. And the information it uses to make those decisions is routing. So it's got to build up some information that allows it to know that for this given packet that's trying to get to some destination IP address, which one of these interfaces is closer, because these are going to connect off to some other router with some interfaces on, and then these are going to connect off to other routers. And so at some point, there's a destination over here, which is where you want to get to. And these routers have to figure out, OK, if this router gets it, it knows that it should go out of that interface and not this interface, because this is going to go off somewhere else. And then when this router gets it, it needs to know it's got to go out of that interface and not this interface, and so on. And so they all have to build up this information. And that's what the routing protocols do, is that these are protocols that run, so the routers exchange information in order that they can work out how to build the tables they'll use for forwarding. And then when a packet actually comes in that needs to be forwarded, they look up the destination address in that forwarding table, and they make a decision on where to send it based on the information they've previously sorted out through the routing protocol. For something like IBV4, you've got 32-bit addresses. So the destination address can be approximately any bit pattern. And so you've got 2 to the 32 possible destinations, which is about 4 billion. So logically speaking, each router kind of has a table with 4 billion entries in. A packet comes in, you look up the destination address in the table, and that says go out of interface 3 or go out of interface 2, whatever it might be. Now, in practice, that clearly would be a stupid thing to do because a table of 4 billion entries is a big table to look through every time. And so there's ways that that table is essentially compressed by using what are called IP prefixes so that instead of just having all the possible addresses, you say, well, OK, let's group the addresses together by some prefix. University of Nottingham prefix is 128.243 slash 16. So all addresses on the internet that begin 128.243 belong to the University of Nottingham. And so a router out there on the internet will receive a packet that's destination is 128.243.6.7 or something. And it doesn't need to look up exactly that address. It just matches that prefix. This table of entries might have .6.5 slash 24. It might have 128.243 slash 16. Lots of different prefixes. And all of these are simply saying, okay, well, there's going to be some bit pattern of ones and zeros. Just some one, some zero, one. zero, 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 I think would be one, two, eight. And then the bit pattern for six, that would be lots of zeros. And then a one, one, zero, dot five. So that'll be, again, zeros, uh, one, zero, one at the end. So it doesn't need to match any of these remaining eight bits. And so it will go down doing that. And what it does is it picks the longest prefix that matches. So you could have an entry here that was 128.243.16 slash 24, for example. And it might be that both of these entries matched, right? So you had the address that you're actually searching for, let's say it's 128.243.16.7. Now that address is going to match both of these entries because the prefix is the same. So these initial bits on the front are the same. And so what will be picked is it will be this entry that's picked, because that's the longest prefix. 24 bits is longer than 16 bits. So it's looking through this to find the most specific, because it's the most, you know, literally the most specified subnet. So they designate ranges of IP addresses. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to find the prefix that best matches the IP address that you've got, that you're looking for the destination of. And so you'll look through this list and you'll find the most specific, which means the longest prefix match, 
and that's the subnet that you're matching against. The router would then essentially look at the packet with, with this as the destination address. It would look up in this table. It would say, OK, this matches here. So that's a possibility. Capes on looking through the table. Oh, matches here. This is the best match so far. Looks through the rest of the table. This is still the best match. So this packet with this destination address gets sent out of interface number one. And that's how forwarding happens. So this is just software that's running on them that's causing certain packets to be transmitted, certain packets to be received and interpreted, and it's information being exchanged between the routers to build up these forwarding tables. There's a couple of standard ways that happens. The, the one I personally find easiest to explain is that you run a protocol that's called a link state routing protocol. And what's essentially happening there is the protocol runs and it attempts to build a map of the network. And then the router can take this map and it can run an algorithm called the shortest paths algorithm and it can find the shortest path between any two points. So then it knows what to do. If it gets a packet coming in, it maps it to a destination, which it can then look up in this, on this map of the network and say, right, what's the shortest path to get to that destination? So you'll have a bunch of routers in the network. They'll be connected in some configuration. Packet comes in, let's say, to this one. Router looks up in the forwarding table what it needs to do with it, and it says, for example, this is the shortest path. Well, it's worked that out in advance by having all of the routers inside this network have been exchanging information with each other as part of the routing protocol so that they can construct this map. So if this packet comes in here and it has to get out of here, then this router will know that the best way to get down to here might be through this guy, which means it's got to go out of this interface, not this interface. Obviously, if that guy or something failed along that If route. something crashes there, then yeah, the routing protocol is still running and it will detect that this guy's crashed or it will detect that in particular these links have failed. And so it will now say, OK, so now the shortest path to get here is to come out of this interface. The three sort of bits of this process are there's a little protocol that will run between two routers on the link. So they essentially will exchange packets with each other called hello packets. And the idea there is simply that if this guy can transmit a packet to this one, this guy receives it, transmits a packet back to say, I've received that. And then this guy transmits a packet back to say, and I received your receipt, if you like. So once they've made these exchanges, they both know that that link is live and that somebody on the other end is listening. So they can both say, right, well, I know that this is router one and router two. They both know now that there's a link between router one to router two. And this will happen on all of these links. And so each router builds up a set of information that says what it's connected to. So that's kind of phase one. And then phase two is that this gets disseminated. I'll try and spell disseminate correctly, probably get it wrong. Each router now starts broadcasting to everybody else. This is what I'm connected to. And that gets disseminated through the whole network. So every router now knows what every other router is connected to. And then each router can run the shortest path algorithm. And each router is trying to build up a consistent set of data about the whole network, and then it runs an independent computation. Part of the normal operation of these is that when one of these links fails, let's say it's not the router that fails, just this link fails, there's a time delay while this router and this router notice because they're continually doing this hello exchange. And there are various different ways this can be shortcut, but it could be the case that it, they have to wait until they stop getting hello packets through. And I think the default configuration on at least one of the instances of this sort of protocol is they'd have to wait for three exchanges to fail before they decide that really the link is down. They then have to update the link state database that they carry. Each one has to update that. And then they have to disseminate that through the rest of the network. And so there's going to be a period of time when this router here still thinks that the shortest path is to go around that because it's not yet learned from this guy that in fact this link is gone. For a period of time while it's still detecting the link failure, then packets will still be being sent down that link and they'll just get dropped because they won't go anywhere. So you'll get some loss. Then for a period of time after this has learned about the link failure, it will send packets through some other route. So things will get sent to it by mistake and it'll have to then send them back somewhere else. But you've got this period of time where things are inconsistent. This is one of the things that happens is that you get routing loops. So you'll have packets going around this loop because they're both disagreeing on what's there. Now, obviously it shouldn't last very long. You do get loops that last longer in more complex configurations. In this kind of thing, you'd expect that to be resolved fairly quickly. But you can get these kind of loops occurring. What you then have is the problem of you've got other networks. If you'd have this sort of protocol across the entire internet, you'd have a case where every router in the internet would have to know the status of every single other router in the internet, which would be many, many, many hundreds of thousands, if not millions. In particular, what would kill you there is that every time something happened, so a link failed, every router in the internet would have to be informed of that before they could make a consistent routing decision. And so what you actually have is you have a different routing protocol, and there is only one instance of this called BGP, which runs between networks to allow information to transit between networks about what can be reached. 
and it's problems in BGP that cause a lot of the issues that you, you can see reported about this kind of thing. So for example, there's a couple of cases I think when YouTube has gone offline and there was one a few years ago when I think it was the Pakistan network operator. They tried to inject information into BGP to prevent people connecting to YouTube from within their network. But because of the way they did that, that information propagated and it caused lots of other networks to also fail to be able to connect to YouTube. It comes back to this prefix routing thing, so there's, I, I don't know what the prefix actually is. It won't be this because this is a private network space, but let's say it's 192.168 slash 16. Let's say that's the YouTube prefix. So it's specified that the first 16 bits are 192.168, and then it doesn't matter what's after that, and that identifies the YouTube network for yeah. the sake of argument. And so you've got this table that's been built up in all the routers, and when a packet comes in trying to get to YouTube, the destination address gets matched. It matches against that prefix. That says which interface it should go out of, and it gets transmitted on. So what they did was they said, okay, well, let's make it 192.168.128 slash 17 and 192.168.127 slash 17. I think that covers the space. The point is that they made it into two longer prefixes. Essentially, what should happen is that should, let's say, go to YouTube. They said, well, what we'll do is we'll have these addresses go to dev null. So we'll drop those packets. So instead of sending them onto YouTube as we should, when they match against these prefixes in our network, we'll just drop the packet, we'll just get rid of it, which means that people going through our network can't get to YouTube. Unfortunately, those prefixes got advertised through BGP. So they got advertised to other networks and other networks pick them up as well. And because these are longer prefixes, they would be preferred to the shorter prefix, which was the right answer. You prefer these instead because they're longer prefixes. So then other networks were doing the same thing. And they were saying, if they weren't really saying to DevNull, they would be saying to the Pakistan network rather than going to YouTube. And so other networks start believing these adverts, these advertised prefixes. They match destination addresses against that that should be going to YouTube and they get sent to the Pakistan network instead. And then those things get dropped. This bad information got propagated out into the rest of the internet, and that now starts to mean that other people who connect to the network through other people's networks also start to see YouTube not being reachable. It was noticed this was a problem, and essentially all that has to happen is that you don't believe these two adverts, and then this one takes over again, and YouTube becomes reachable again. With BGP, you can apply routing policies. So you can start to say things like, <clears throat> um, I can reach these networks, but I'd prefer that you didn't use me to get there. Or, I, you know, I can reach these, but our contract says that you should use these others in preference. Or you should use me in preference for these different things. Or when you re-advertise that you can now reach these networks because you can get to them through me, you have to advertise them in such and such a way, or I'd like you to advertise them in such and such a way, so that not everybody in the world tries to come through me. That I'm like, a, I'm a last resort, I'm a backup link, or whatever it might be. So you can start to apply these kind of more complex configurations to how this information gets disseminated. Whereas in this case, with this like link state routing, it really is just a case of detect what you're connected to, tell everybody else what you're connected to, run the shortest path, and that's it. So these numbers get assigned hierarchically. Um, so there's a body called IANA, the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority, I think, 